Amen. Thank you. <coughs> I should have left that last note alone. <coughs> <coughs> Would you pray with me, please? Holy and all-loving God, what an honor it is to be back into this holy place again this morning where we may hear your word proclaimed to us once more. Respond with beautiful songs to your holy name and a desire for your blessing to be bestowed upon us once more. So we ask for your blessing that you would remove all things that separate us from you and draw us closer to your ways. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. <clears throat> Today is a very interesting Sunday, one that has been much aligned in many of our churches, for it is a Sunday, Sunday that we proudly proclaim Christ as king. Now, depending upon where you grew up and whether or not you went to church when you were growing up, what kind of church that may have been, you may or may not have ever heard of Christ the King Sunday. <clears throat> For here in the United States, with our own sometimes peculiar forms of Christianity, Declaring Christ of, as king rings hollow in many people's ears, can even be offensive to some people. For we fought a war 200 some odd years ago to free ourselves of a king and to vow never to be ruled under such a system again. <clears throat> So most of us may not really have a good understanding of what it means to declare someone as king and to submit to someone as our king. And so for many U.S.-based churches, if this Sunday is observed at all, it can be referred to as the Reign of Christ Sunday, or the Realm of Christ Sunday. And we've done that here at St. Jude's. I looked back the past two or three years we have used Reign of Christ Sunday. <clears throat> but this year I want to return to Christ the King and ask that we use our modern day sensibilities to understand Christ as king in the context we live in today. But before we do that, we might want to have a little bit of history. In the era that Jesus lived, kings were autocratic rulers. And if you lived under one, which just about every person on the planet did, then your life did not ultimately belong to you. The king and the state and the nation state where you lived had ultimate control over your life. And in the time of Jesus, that state apparatus was the Roman Empire. And the big kings of Rome were known as Caesar, as in Julius Caesar, and, and the one who ruled when Jesus was alive, Tiberius Caesar. And these kings, these Caesars, were treated as actual gods on earth. Not spokespeople for God, representatives of God, but gods, actual living little g gods, put on earth to rule over others. And then under these Caesars, way up here, were actually kings who were called kings subservient to Roman Caesars, but still king and ruler over you. King Herod, of course, ruler of Israel in the time of Jesus. <clears throat> and this king system has been in place ever since. Kings and queens of Europe 
were believed to be selected by God to rule over other people and their nations. It's still believed to be that in some places. And not just in Europe. All over the world there are kings who claim a divine right to rule over you. Having the right to make life and death decisions about people with little or no care about the people themselves or any consequences their actions might bring. There weren't any for them. And so it was in this context of Caesar being an actual god and king that made up the world in which Jesus lived and that the gospel writers wrote about. Several times in the Gospels, Jesus makes it very clear that he is not a king. And that if people were going to keep on insisting on calling him a king, then he said, well, then my kingdom is not of this world. So that was the ancient context that Jesus challenged. The inhumane and corrupt system built upon the blood, sweat, and tears of entire nations of people. And the deeply ironic thing about all this is that God never wanted it to be this way. God was quite clear that the people of the Exodus, the chosen people of God, that they should not have kings of their own. And that if they insisted upon joining that system of rule, there would be consequences. So before there were kings, there were prophets. Prophets who spoke on behalf of God. And one of those prophets was Samuel. Now when Samuel was getting old, he anointed his two sons to take over his responsibilities. But his sons turned out to be rather corrupt, dishonest, and cheats. And so the elders of Israel, they all got together and they went to Samuel and said to him, your sons are cheats, so give us a king like everybody else has, for then we will be free of this corruption and become a mighty and respected nation. As if that was going to be a good idea. And so it says, with a lot of reluctance, Samuel goes to God and says, this is what the people want. And God replies, but this is not what I want for you. But you have gone against me ever since I led you out of Egypt. You continue to place other people and other things before me. Other gods, golden calves, your own desire for power and personal wealth. So go ahead. Get yourself a king. But know very well what you are doing. For these kings will rule over you and demand your loyalty above all other things, and you will forget what I have done for you. Which is exactly what happened. Now, that's the history. Fast forward some 3,000 years from the time of Samuel, Samuel, and guess what? We still find the world mired in corruption, dishonesty, and cheating. So back in the 1920s, 1925 to be exact, during a time of rising nationalism, fascism, and Nazism, placing leaders above God, Pope Pius XI instituted Christ the King Sunday hoping to bring attention to how these worldly rulers were increasing their absolute power. 
And by proclaiming Christ as king, he sought to bring the world back to Christ. To say that our allegiance belongs only to Christ, and through Christ we should seek to establish the kingdom of God on earth and relegate our rulers to the sometimes mundane and bureaucratic tasks of management. But sadly, as we know, this only worked in probably the most minimal of cases. For these same powers, these same structures of powers, are still at play in the world today. You know, we may sing of our blessings, be grateful for all that God has given us, but we can also sometimes feel a little self-righteous and say things like, well, God is first in my life in all things, except for just a couple of things. Money. My money. Don't even go there. Don't touch that one. But it's also our, our ideas our ideas about ourselves, how we view ourselves, secretly and publicly, our ideas about other people, how we view them, secretly and publicly, our ideas about what constitutes success, who is a success, who is a failure. And our idea of who is worthy of being a role model in our lives. You know, who are the people we should emulate? Celebrities? Movie stars? Politicians? Social media stars? people who are famous only because they are (coughs) famous? I imagine if you ask most people under the age of 30 to name some of these people, I bet they can come up with at least 30. Ask many of them about Jesus Christ, and I bet the vast majority could not even give one example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And that is why we should have no qualms about proclaiming Christ as our King and set aside this one day as Christ the King Sunday. A day that we can be reminded that nothing should come before God. Not our own needs, not the needs of others, and certainly not other people. And I have to admit, this is where a lot of people get confused. For this is not to say that we simply turn a blind eye to our own needs and the needs of others. We simply trust that God will show us a way to provide these needs. We still need to feed the hungry. But we should remember the story of manna from heaven as God's provision. We still need to take care of our own needs. But we should remember the story of the lilies of the field about how God cares for us. And be careful of raising up celebrities sports stars and politicians as our role models, people who are successful in life. Remember the stories of Samson and even King Solomon. Strong, good-looking, much-admired biblical figures who fell due to their own arrogance. 
When we put Christ first as our one and only King, receiving all of our allegiance, every single ounce of our trust and worship, when Christ replaces all other things in our lives, then the kingdom of God is our reward. A kingdom that is not quite fully here, we're told, but is very close. The kingdom of God is near, said Jesus. We have been given but a glimpse of this kingdom. But this glimpse should actually be enough to alter our entire lives. So much so that we can no longer simply claim to be a follower of Jesus and then ignore the needs of so many people in the world. No longer can we sing rousing hymns about God's glory and majesty and then ignore the plight of the earth. No longer can we pray that God's kingdom come, and yet then claim so many things to be within our own little personal kingdoms. The kingdom of God may not be here, but it is close. And we must work toward it. We must continually pray to know what is the next right thing, the next loving thing, that whatever they may be, they will be revealed to us. Christ the King Sunday, and now all days, are days that we should pray that all world leaders, governments, and nations would honor Christ as King. And that each of our individual hearts, minds, souls, and bodies would honor Christ as well. I wish that would happen right now, instantly that the whole world would simply change in the blinking of an eye. But there are a lot of people and leaders and governments and nations that have not accepted this. Matter of fact, outright reject this. So we do what we can. What God places before us each and every day. We feed people. We care for one another. We work toward the kingdom of God. We go out and share the good news in a world that still hungers for truth. We go out and spread the message, you know, that we do not have to live our lives in frustration, resentment, and anger all the time that we can actually live lives governed by care and love and forgiveness and gratitude. For when we do these things, we shall be called the prophets of the Most High, sent into the world to prepare the coming of the Lord by bringing light into the darkness and knowledge of salvation for all of those who still live in darkness. So my friends, may you know, accept, and proclaim Christ as King and live in the peace and comfort of this assurance. For in the end, there is no other name than Jesus that can offer us such an abundant life. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, open our eyes to your kingdom. Allow us to see it blooming all around us. 
Give us the hope and the faith we need to believe and to act. And Lord, have mercy on us when we knowingly or even unknowingly place others and other things before you. Restore our knowledge of your reign and the wisdom to know your ways. Please grant us the compassion of your heart and the zeal of your word to reach out to those who need our love, who need our care, who need our understanding and our compassion. And may we just simply accept and know and believe and act according to your will. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silence and allow all of these words to work themselves into our hearts. <laughs>